Welcome to Go on the Run. And today we're going to be writing a simple encoder decoder. But if you remember, in the previous video, we wrote a simple cipher. And you might be hard pressed to really explain or even see the difference between the two. Now, these things are very, very strange how they are similar, but also in their purpose and intent. That is what makes them different. And so I'll try and clear that up for you today. We can say that oh, we have a slice of bytes and we can perform some binary operation on them. And let's take, for example, I have a byte of uh, some bytes that represents this message, a secret message. And so the blank ones there are the spaces, right? So it says a secret message. Now I want to feed this as input to some mapper. I'm going to call it a mapper because I'm using the general sense of something that takes input, transforms in some way, and produces output. And so let's say once I pass my byte through the mapper, it produces this. Now, is this, um, my, is my message cipher, or was it encoded in some way? And that is what we're going to try and answer. From this example here, well, you don't know yet. But I'll claim that, oh, I encoded my message and it's not just cipher. Even though when you compare this to maybe what we did the last time, where you can put in a message and a password of some length, and you'd get back a message of the similar length. And it could potentially look like this if you choose the right password. I don't know. Okay. So, like I said, I'm going to explain why this is encoding in a bit. But before I do that, let me show you something very simple. Let's say this is my keyboard. Now I'm in the West, so I use a Western keyboard, but you can apply what I'm gonna show you to almost any um, keyboard anywhere else. And so th let's say this is my keyboard. And if I were to allow you to type a secret message on this keyboard, what would come out as the, what we saw as the input. But if I overlay instead a not a keyboard or you know a printout of another keyboard, and instead, I simply put, you know, a different set of letters. So the red, so what was previously Q is now A. And what was previously W is now B. And notice all I did is I took the alphabet and just start from A, B, blah, 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 and just went along like that. And just, just with this simple change, now if I ask you to type the same message on this new keyboard, now I overlay my new keyboard, which is red, on top of my previous keyboard. But if I now ask you to type the same message, now this is fairly easy to do. I mean, in Go, this simply just look like a map like this, which is if the input is Q, spit out A, and vice versa, vice versa. So you can see if I now ask you to type the same message, well, you will get exactly this. Because if you go back to that keyboard overlay, when you type a, you got Q and so on. All right. So to get my new message here, I simply did a simple mapping, right? I had something, a mapper that had this table, basically a lookup table. And in order to write this, I did not have to provide any sort of password or anything external. Everything in that, that my mapper needed was contained within the map, mapper function. It didn't need anything external other than the input. It produced the output. It did not need a key. And that is where I'm going to claim that the difference between cipher versus encoding is that with a cipher, you have data that you're going to present to some operator as input. But you also must provide a key in order to get your output. Without that, the cipher would not work. And that's what we did in the previous video. For encoding, which is on the other side of this line, you have data, you're going to present it to some operator and input, which in this case was our mapper, and you're going to be able to get your output. So why would you do this? Well, what is the purpose? Well, for that, I'll give you, I'll go over some text that I think explains it really, really well. So one of the things you might want to do is if you're trying to understand encoding or encryption or any of those sort of things, compression whatsoever, you will jump on the web and probably end up at Wikipedia. And sure enough, Wikipedia 
generally have some really, really good information about how to encode things. But I'm not going to use Wikipedia to try and explain encoding. Another place you might end up is Stack Overflow, one of my favorite places to go. And so, for example, I searched for difference between encoding and encryption, and it just so happened that there was a Stack Overflow article. So I searched this in Google, and there was a Stack Overflow article with essentially the exact same um, title, actually the exact same title. And so if you scroll along, you'll see this little section answer here that's been checked off. And it says, encoding transform data into another format using a scheme that is publicly available so that it can easily be reserved, reversed. That's encoding. Hmm. Doesn't really tell us a whole lot, right? Encryption, transform data into another format. So, so far, encoding and encryption transform the data, which we have seen. We've seen that though when we read, wrote our, our cipher before, it transformed our data into something else. And the same thing with in, encoding in the visualization just now. But here's the thing. In such a way that only specific individuals can reverse the transformation. And so this was the case when we wrote our cipher. Without the correct key, those are the certain indiv specific individual. The individual with the correct key couldn't recover our message. No, we could have brute force attack where somebody just keep trying different, different um, values, but that's always possible. But they still would require the correct key, regardless of how they get it, whether they know it or they guessed it, but it would still require the correct key. This says that how this information was sourced from here. And if you click on this, you will come to this page. Now, I already have this page open. And so, if you scroll down, this page is going to explain encoding versus encryption versus hashing versus obfuscation. Now, they all are related, but remember what I said um, earlier is the intent. What is the purpose of what is it that you're trying? Why is it that you're transforming text, readable text or whatever? And sometimes not always readable too. So maybe you could have binary data, like a file that you want to encode as text so that you can send it. Otherwise, so that you might not be able to transmit it in email, for example. And so there are all those different ways of doing um, transforming data. You might want to um, encode something so that uh, you can detect errors, for example. So let's just um, read this. And so there's often a significant confusion among the differences between encryption, encoding, hashing, and obfuscation. So let's take a look here. So it says encoding. The purpose of encoding, so this is why it's important to know the purpose of why you're transforming text. So if given that message that we had, when we encode it versus when we cipher it, what is the purpose? The purpose of encoding is to transform data so that it can be properly and safely consumed by different types of system. Example, a binary data being sent over email or viewing special character on a web page. The goal is not to keep information secret, but rather to ensure that it's able to be properly consumed. So if you want to keep something secret, you really don't want to encode it because that transformation like what we did is a very simple transformation and the purpose of encoding is to make publicly available how it was transformed. So the only reason that you'd want to encode something is to allow it to um, be represented differently for depending on where it's being consumed or if you want to send it. And so when we encode our message just now, it looks different, but it will still ask you text, right? Just imagine, let's say we wanted to um, put it in an email and maybe, you, or we want to send it to someone and we're afraid that our spaces wouldn't be preserved, for example. Well, encoding would allow us to say, well, take all the spaces and special characters and change them to something else so that they could be prefer, pre preserved. And on the other side, we will decode them and replace and, and restore the spaces and so on. So there's one reason for encoding. We're not trying to keep the information secret, but what we're trying to do is protect it against somehow the medium or something that it that might be biased. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. And so for to give you some example, like ASCII, Unicode, and all those are different ways in which you can encode um, you know, characters. What does it look like? How do how do we interpret it?
Now, base64 encoding is a very popular one. It's how you take like binary data and turn it into all text so that um, it can be represented again in a way that you can send it in email. And then the person who gets it can then decode it and turn it back into binary data. The purpose of encryption is to transform data in order to keep it secret from other. Sending someone a secret letter that only they should be able to read or securely send them password over the internet. Rather than focusing on usability, the goal is to ensure that data cannot be consumed by anyone other than the intended recipients. Encryption transforms data into another format in such a way that only specific individual can reverse the transformation. It uses a key, which is kept secret, because if you're going to encrypt something with a key and then you can tell everyone the secret, the key, then well, what was the purpose of encrypting it? So you should only give the key to those who intended to be able to access that information. And so in conjunction with the plain text and the algorithm in order to perform the encryption operation, as such, the ciphertext algorithm and key are all required to return to the plain text. And that is what we saw. With our cipher, you need the key as the other input in addition to whatever it is that you're encrypting or decrypting in order to perform that operation. With the encoding, we didn't need a key. All right. So I'm not going to go through hashing. We're going to talk about hashing another time, and we'll probably come back to this. Now, let's go take a look at our code of some code and see how we can implement that's a little simple encoder that i mentioned in the beginning so here we are in our directory and we have part two and so we're going to copy this and call it part three for example so let's do that and let's call this part three simple encoder and decoder and let's get into the directory. Start with Visual Studio Code. And we have a few examples there. I don't want these encryption text file. We don't need those. Uh, if we have to recreate them, we'll recreate them. And I can remove uh, exercise one, two, and three because those were our earlier exercise. And we'll literally start over with exercise um, four as our exercise one. So that means we're literally picking up from where we left off. Okay, so this exercise one is our previous exercise four. Okay, and this is where we did an encryption. So this is our message. We had a key and we, use it, we were able to use this XR function to encrypt it. And we wrote it out to a file so we could pretend that our we store it, send it over the wire, whatever, send it in an email, and then our receiver was able to use that encrypted data and the key and be able to recover the message. So let's change, clean up this code a little bit. And so what I will do is I will say, okay, um, first of all, I want to change the name of our function here from XR to just Cypher. That's and just a simple name change. I'm going to call it Cypher. C I P H E R, if you don't mind. Remember, you can use C Y P also, it's also expe uh, acceptable um, spelling. And what I'll do is I'll say that I'll, here we um, encrypt, and this is encrypt, and this is decrypt. No, it really is the same function in, in this case, the way we have implemented a symmetric cipher. Um, later on, we'll talk about the asymmetric or asymmetric encryption, but here it's symmetric because we use the same key for encryption and decryption. And so I'll create a variable, some variable here, and I'll say we have this encrypt variable, which is equals to our cipher um, function name. And that's that. And the same thing, because we know that both are the same, um, do the same work. So decrypt. So, okay. So it's just help us with um, trying to visualize what's happening when we use encrypt and decrypt. Okay. So that's all I've really done. Okay. Okay. So our code should still work, right? 
um, if we run it, we should still see the same result and there's the decrypted method message. So, yep, so nothing really changed. What I want to do, the other thing I want to do, I would like to do is to be able to create um, some functions. Again, simplify things. So I'm going to say, I have this function called sender, who is going to send a message. I have a function called receiver, and rec, i before e, receiver, who is going to receive the message. And let's also, uh, okay, and now this is our sender. He has the private message, and he's going to write it to a file, right? Send it to the sender. We can imagine this is email. So sender has a message and the key and writes it, um, encrypt the message, writes it to a file. Okay. Now, our receiver needs to receive this message. So we can put it here. But before they can receive the message, well, they need to be able to have access to the key. So, but remember, they're the intended receiver, so they have the exact same key that we plan to use. And of course, they need to be able to read the contents of this file. So let's do um, the encrypted message is stored in this file, and we can check for errors, but I'm gonna ignore errors for now, assuming that there's no errors. I'm gonna use IOUtil that, and I'm going to read the use the read file function. And what this does is it takes a file name or encrypted file, and what it returns is the bytes and an error, but I'm ignoring error. So we read back in the bytes, and now we pass that in using the key, and we should expect to see the same thing. The only thing I've done is separated the two, but it functionally is still the same. So we can say we have the sender and the receiver. And so if I save this and I rerun the code, the result should be the same, and it is, right? Just reorganizing the code a little bit. What I want to demonstrate for you is that if we had an attacker who had the incorrect key, that attacker would not be able to read our message. And they're going to have a key that is some guess. And this is the attacker's um, output. Um, and so if we, oh, I need to call the attacker. <laughs> and so there we go. And let's clean up and rerun. And as you can see, the attacker is not able to recover a message. So the key is important. We didn't do this demonstration when we did our cipher that all using the wrong key just does not give you back the message. What if the attacker's guess is very close to our key? Let's say instead of just a guess, the attacker actually guessed something like S-E-C-R-E-T, secret two, for example, right? Or just secret would they be able to recover our message? And so if we run this, and we should already imagine, be able to anticipate what's gonna happen because the way in which we wrote our cipher was what we're doing is basically taking this byte and XOR on it with the first byte and so on until we exhaust this and then we repeat. So you can imagine that if the key looks resemble ours, that they should be able to recover some of the message. And so, we know that. So this is not, that's why I call this a simple cipher and it's good for illustration only. Notice how part of our message was recovered. See, part of our message was recovered here. Okay, so if the attacker guesses something and the closer they are to the, the length that we have, so for example, if we put two here, for example, that's even more of a message that they're gonna recover. And so we run this. And we scroll up, you'll see, got a little bit more, right? A little bit more there, and so here. But I still want to show you that with OD correct key, they cannot recover the exact message. We're talking about encoded. I just wanted to go back and show you that our cipher required the correct key. Okay, so now that we have that, let's now, um, Copy this and 
I want to paste it here. So we have exercise two, and I don't really need we don't really need this file. But let's clean up, bring this down a little bit. And so now we want to talk about encoding and decoding. And if you remember what I said is that the simple encoder that I have, and here it is, that picture again, is that I'm simply going to try and overlay um, A through Z onto the existing letters on my keyboard so that if you input, you know, Z, for example, you get A and so on. And so let's see how we can write that encoder that does exactly that. So I'll still be doing, um, using the same message that I have here, but instead, I don't want to call this a cipher. And this is no longer a cipher. It's just an encoder. And something that, let's call it encoder. So there we go. And up here, well, actually, uh, <laughs> let's see. Let's just call this, yep, that's coder. And so we'll call our functions here. We'll change this to just encode this guy to be decode. And we'll set this to um, change both of these to encoder. Okay, so they both uh, point to the same function. And I'll leave my sender, receiver, and attacker the same. We still have a message that we want to send. But now remember, we're writing an encoder. We don't need a key. So no key here, no key here either. And instead of encrypting, we're just simply encoding a message. So we call it encode function. And receiver, similarly, we don't need a key. And we don't need a key here again. Uh, so we can get rid of these two like that. And it's not decrypt, but rather decode. So this is decode, and let's put here uh, decoded, decoded. All right, and so this is the attacker message, and that's fine. We'll leave that like that. And so we're still reading from this file enc.txt. The only reason this is complaining is because both of our um, encode, um, because of our encode function is taking a key, and we do not need a key. All right, so that looks like it's okay now. Um, now, in terms of our encoder, um, we don't really have to do a whole lot. Actually, an encoder is much, much easier to write. And so for that, I can show you this. Let's go to Golang package and the bytes package. And so if you look at index and look at some of the functions that you have, you can compare things, search for things, blah, 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 yada, yada. But one of the things that I mentioned is that we can use map, which is essentially what we have been doing. We've been simply iterating over the slice of bytes that we have. And so we have out and we can say out is equals to, let's do out is equals to, uh, Let's see, make a slice, byte slice, that's the length of the buffer. And so now we have our output there. And then we can say for, and one way to do this is to just simply say for i equals the range of buffer. And now we don't have to append, but we can simply say, like for example, out of i and we can do some kind of operation. Uh, let's say it was an exclusive or operation we wanted to do on, I don't know, six or something like that. And that would be it. So we're operating on each, well, um, actually not quite, that's incorrect. Out is equals to, let's say V and some operation, something like that, right? And that's one way to do things. Oh, we'd simply return um, yeah, there we go. Let's see. Colon equals, yep. So that's the problem there. And so there's something like this. And so you can see for each byte in buffer, we are performing some operation. So what does map give us is the ability to apply a function, to provide a function 
that's applied to a slice of bytes and it return a slice of bytes. So it says here, map returns a copy of the byte slice s with all of its characters modified according to the mapping function. It seems to me that's exactly what we want. We are going to have a map function and let's write our map function. Our map function is going to be some function we're gonna call it mapper that takes a byte, let's call it in byte and return a byte. Now what does mapper get, how is it determine what um, byte to produce? Well, when we look at the little um, overlay of our keyboard, what we saw was this. We saw that we can have, let's call it encoding map, um, is equals to a map of byte to byte, okay? And what we had was this. If the input was Q, then you produce A. And if the input was W, then you produce B. And so notice the last, the, the output is just A through Z because that's all we did it. And if you put in E, you get out C, for example. And if we keep going across my Western keyboard, I come to R, this means the input is R, I get out D. And so you can keep going like this. And it's eventually what you're gonna have, this whole thing is gonna look like this. And as you can see, let me save changes. Yeah. Um, you can see Q, A, W, B, and all this other stuff till you get to the bottom of the keyboard, which M give you Z. And so if you look at the second value, the value, whereas the first one is the key and then value, key and then value. If you look at the values, they go from A through Z, okay? And then the keys are all sort of random, well, quirky, quirky keyboard or whatever they call it. And so now that we have that, this is all lowercase. What we wanna be able to do now is to do the same thing for uppercase. And so this is, an, this I already got that. And so now we have our encoding map, which maps input letters to output letters. And so that's all we have to do is return em of in. That's it. That's our mapping function. And our oh, function, there we go. And that's all we need for a mapping function. And now for encoding, we can simply do return bytes that map and give it the mapping function, which is mapper, and then give it our input slide, which is buff. And now, let's see, there we go. Oh, so if we look at this map function, it says rather it expects a rune and it returns a rune. And so that's okay. We can say that our, our function expects a rune and returns a rune. So the reason why this is a problem is because we're input here is a rune and return. So we can easily just convert this to a byte, cast this to a byte, or simply makes this a rune also, a map of runes. And once we save, save changes, everybody's happy. And so this is it. So remember, we didn't really change much except to remove the keys. And we declare this mapping function. So this is our rule of, oh, you take something from the input, produce an output, no keys required. And this is our mapping function that simply takes one room, produce another room by looking it up in this map. And this is our encoder that uses the byte step map function. It is the exact same thing as if we iterated over it. So you can use either one. All right, so now that we have this, let's run our code. And this is exercise two, so we can close this. And let's run this. So this doesn't look very promising at all. Like we encoded a message and we were supposed to decode it and get back our original message, but that's not what happened. But if we go right from the command line, um, this is what happened. So we build it, we do go run and or main that go. And when we run it, we see that, oh, well, it does look a little bit crazy, but why didn't it decode? Well, to understand why it didn't decode, is let's look at our encoder. So, or the function that we're using as our coder. And so, if we give it capital T when we're encoding, it replaces it with 
capital E. So far, so good. When we go to decode the message, however, we'll be giving it capital E, which in turn will give it reproduce C, and that's why we have C here. So we're in double encoding our message. We're not actually decoding it when we run it a second time. So what we really need to do is to write a decoder. And so what we need is another map that does the reverse. So we call this our decoder map. And we know it's always going to be rune of rune. And we'll just put in the reverse of what we did previously. And so now what we should expect is the keys should go from A through Z, which is A, B, C. And so, for example, when we put in E, we should get T. And that is because before when we put in T, we get E. So to decode, when we put in E, we should get T. So this is the reverse. And so now what we need is a decoder. So this is our encoder. We need a decoder. So let's call this decode and let's call this encode. And so now we can get rid of these variables up here. So, and so now if we run this, let's see what happens. Well, since we have the command line here, let's rerun it from the command line. And there you go. Well, it didn't change. Uh, let's see, did we save changes? Oh, yep, of course. Why am I surprised? <laughs> my decoder, I have my decoder map, but my decoder here is still using the same mapper. So um, I don't need my decoder to use this mapper, but to use the other mapper. So one way I can do that is I could write a second mapper, like a decode mapper and an encode mapper, but the function is so simple, I'll just put it here. So it's a function that takes a rune. So we have n as a rune. And then we return a rune. And so all our function does is return the inc for the encoder map this, right? And so for decode, we do essentially the same thing. So this guy is a function. Um, this needs to be func. A function that takes in as a rune and returns a rune. Come on. Room, and it returns from our decoded map. So that's the difference. So I was still using the same mapping function, mapper. All right, so now I'm actually using two different mappers. All right, let's rerun, okay? And there we go. So this is our message. So we, we were able to decode our message. Notice no key, again, no key, we just map in. So this would be an example if we were sending our message to some channel that was hostile to spaces and we want to re remove the spaces and secure a message or somehow not only spaces but um, special characters. This is one way one way we could encode it by removing it, right? Um, of course, we could put special things in there to represent that or we remove the character and replace it with something else that when we decode it, it will allow us to get back our character. So for example, on encoding, what we can say is if you see a character, an empty space, for example, then replace it with underscore. Maybe we know that our um, text doesn't have, the text will never have an underscore in it. And of course, on decode, if you see an underscore, then replace it with a space, something like this. And so now when we run, we'll see that, um, we encode and decode and we get back essentially our original message. Of course, we didn't handle the punctuation, but you get the idea. And so if I do cat of our encoded file, you'll see that would have the weird things and on the score, right? Replace. So that's one way of doing an encoder. Now, if you go back here and you look at this map and you expand it, you see that they're actually doing some encoding here too. Um, so here's their function called rot13. And it's just a function that takes a rune and return a rune. So this is, would be just like our mapper function. 
and all it is is a function literal so it's stored in a variable but look what happens r is passed in as the rune and so you do a switch statement and the case that r is greater than a capital a and less than equal to capital z this is what you return you return a character that is capital a plus the difference between r remember r could only be greater than equals to a or less than greater than equals to capital z so if you look at the boundary condition when r is equals to a this is simply going to be a minus a which is 0 plus 13 and if you do the modulus of 13 with 26 and i cover uh, modulus operations in some of my go programming language video um, if you're not comfortable with that do check out my um, go programming video or very soon in a week or two I'll be posting my entire Go for Taurus, um, GoLang programming for Taurus video. So do check that out. I cover modulus operation. But essentially what a modulus operation is, it's like a divide operation, except it returns the remainder. So normally um, when you do a divide, you get the quotient. Here you get the remainder. So 13 divided by 26 will actually return 13. And so you take 13 and you add it to, to capital A, and that's just going to give you which character is 13, you know, letters later. And so one added to A would be B. So if you go look at the ASCII table here, you could do just ASCII table on in Google or whatever your favorite search engine is, and you'll find it. So if we go through the math of this, what you see is um, A is going to map to 13 letters ahead. We see A is 65 plus 13, that's 78, which means that our A is going to be mapped to N. And you can apply the same logic and say, if it's B, well then B is gonna be mapped to O, and you keep going until you eventually get to 13 characters be before this, which would be seven to seven. So M would be mapped to Z. So if you're given the letter M, you'd get Z out. Now, once you pass M, <laughs> you put in N, What's going to happen? It's going to wrap around. So N is going to be mapped to A, and O is going to be mapped to B, and blah, 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 blah. So it's almost like what we have done. And so that's what's done with this formula. And you can put it in and play with it yourself. Now, if the character is between lowercase a and lowercase z, the exact same thing happened. The only difference now is you're dealing with lowercase. And so again, lowercase a gets to maps to lowercase m and exactly the same thing as before and any other character if it's space or any special character just return it don't do anything mapping with it only do mapping with the alpha um, alphabet and so but you could have done other things too you could have said well okay we want to map like numbers to special characters so we'll map these 10 digits to 10 special characters here maybe and vice versa and depending on what you you really want and so if we were to run this code, you can see it how they pass in a string here, which we can make slightly more readable, like saying, and run it. And you'll see that how the output is this crazy looking thing. But if we actually save this into some variable, I'll just save it into a variable like this. I'll copy from bytes down to here. I cut it paste it here, save it, print it out, and then print out what we get back if we do the encoding, okay, uh, backslash n, backslash n, and if I do bytes that map that rot13, the same function, with the input that was produced previously, so we give back the same thing. And you should see uh, missing a da, 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 parentheses here. And we run it. And you will see that oh, we encode to this value. And then we get back exactly what we put in. Um, so this is one encoding function that can be used both ways. In our example, because we were doing something slightly different, well, we had to have a, a separate encoder and decoder. But notice our encoder did one thing. The forward operation and our decoder undo whatever our, our encoder did and you could run these in any order you want you could just rename the functions and they work equally well 
Okay, so one final example I would like to show you, and it's um, with some tools that's built into your on your computer. Um, if you're on a Unix-like system, so if you're on a Unix-like system, you should have something a program called Base64, Base64, and basically it's in there waiting for some input. But um, well, let's do this. Let's type "Hello World" and see what we get. Control C. Okay, it did, or maybe I should type Control D rather. Hello world, and then enter Control D, and so there it goes. So this is always encoded Hello world. Now the thing what Base sixty four is used for is to it does not include spaces. Even if you have spaces in in your message, it does not include too many special characters. I don't know exactly which one it doesn't include, and so it's safe to sort of send an email. But the thing that's really nice for not text because remember encoded not really to secure anything it might look crazy but really to protect against the medium that you want to send so the thing with sending things with spaces and all these fancy characters and um email they might the spaces might change you know something like two spaces might get collapsed to one or one space might get expanded to two um you know um, a single quote might look like a fancy back tick and so on like that so for those reasons you want to do something like um, base64 encoded so here's an example let's do go build and this builds our binary and so we have it there and we can run it so our binary runs exactly the same and so let's say we wanted to send this to a friend and because this is a binary file maybe we can't really simply do attachment so all we can do is send text maybe we're prevented from sending binary data because for security concern they don't want to be hacked you know sometimes people send binaries in email that um, can attack the system if the person ex use um, open it so you don't want people to be clicking on binaries and email attachment and therefore compromise possibly compromising the system so we do is send it as text because text cannot be executed so even if they click on the attachment, it would just be a text file. But if they actually want to run it, then they have to do some work. So what do you do? You do, um, so of course you can use the man page for base64, and you can see that it's pretty simple to use. You can do minus D for decode, or minus I for input file, minus O for output. Without that, by default, it reads from standard in and standard out. So that's why we're able to use it the way we did just now. But Let's do this. So let's do base64. And what we want to do is minus input is our command file. This is a binary file. Uh, we know it's a binary file because I can just execute it. And also if I do cat on CMD, you can see it's just a binary file there. So I'll just stop this nonsense and I'll clear my screen. And so I could do base64 uh, minus input is my CMD file. Now, if I do, um, oh, if I just enter, it would write it out to the terminal. I don't want that, so I'll redirect it to a file called cmd2.txt, cmd.txt, because that's what it is. The command is my text version of this command. And now, if I type head on cmd.txt, um, I can see um, quite a bit of text scroll by, and this is all of it that represent that binary file. It's in one very long line. That's why when I type, type cat, cat, it spit out the whole nonsense. But when we did um, man on base64, we noticed that uh, there was a minus b command for how many lines you should give it. So maybe we want to do break it at 64 lines or 80 lines, depending on how wide you want your lines, and we can do something like that. And so now if I do head on cmd, um, that's what I look like, where each line is 80 characters. But you know, you can make it anything you want for formatting purposes. Let's say you want to send an email and you didn't want it to be one super long line, uh, maybe you can break it up. But this still is the exact same content. It doesn't change. If I do tail on cmd.txt, um, you'll see that oh, it's going to end with exactly those set of lines there. Um, zero, Z, Q, A, dash. And that's what you see there. So it doesn't change. Just break the lines for you, format it. Well, okay, so now that you have a text file that you can send your body through email, you send it, and now you've protected them or guarded against somebody clicking on that um, text file and executing it, they can't. It's just a text file. How does your body turn this back into executable? Well, your body just simply use base64 again, and you say, I want to decode this text file, which is the input here is cmd.txt, that is we provide in the text file, and I want you to produce, uh, save the output, which is gonna be binary, because I know that's what was encoded, because my friend told me, and I want you to put it in cmd2. We don't wanna overwrite the existing one we have, because we're on the same system. 
but I want to show you that the two files are identical. So if I do ls, I'll have um, ls minus l, maybe. All right, let's do this. Um, so, oh, exe, my fancy thing. So we can see that all the two files are there. So if I do ls minus l, you'll see my cmd2, it's just a regular file, it's not executable because I just created a file. But if I change it and make it executable, change minus, minus x. And all this has nothing to do in coding this part, what I'm doing here. This is all Unixy stuff. And so now I have ls, I have my two executable file. Now notice, remember, when we run cmd, this is what we got. So when I run cmd2, I should get the exact same result. And I do, because hopefully you're convinced by now that encoding and decoding does not change, shouldn't, if it's done correctly, shouldn't change the content, um, what was given, right? I should be able to produce the result. I always say that, well, it's not working correctly. And another way to prove that these two files are identical, if the fact that they run as executable doesn't convince you, or that they have the exact same number of bytes still doesn't convince you, we can do MD5, which is something we're gonna learn about probably next on CMD star. And we can see that how, when it comes to the command, and this other command, they're both identical signature. So that is called a hash or signature of those files and they compute out to be the exact same thing. And so that you can use to say that oh, they are indeed identical files. All right, so I will hand it here. Um, thanks for your time. Um, this is going to be the last video of this year. Regardless of how you celebrate the holiday season, I hope you're safe and enjoy it. Um, I'll try to get my Patreon page going and probably put out a video about that, providing you some information about that. And then the other thing I'll try to do during the holiday season, but definitely not before Christmas because tomorrow is Christmas here um, in the United States. So it wouldn't happen before Christmas, but I'll try to put it out sometime before early next year is my complete goal length for tourist course that I have on Udemy. Udemy. I promise I'll post that to YouTube and I will. Um, during the next two weeks. Um, with that said, I hope you learned something. I hope you're enjoying this sort of fundamental, basic, simplified look at security. And um, if you have added questions or suggestions, please let me know. If you like what you're seeing, click the subscribe button if you haven't subscribed yet. Um, spread the word. Let other people know what you're enjoying. Um, click hit the notify button so that you can be notified when I post videos. Thumbs up the videos. Um, give feedback. Take care, have a great day.